pleasure to be here. And uh, like Don said, thanks for coming out and braving the rain. I know SoCal, you know, it's tough. It's like, what is this stuff? You know, especially these days with climate change. When I was down here working on the Cleveland National Forest, just um, east of here, um, SoCal went through its um, the driest 15 month span in the history of record keeping, going back 110 years. So um, yeah, rain is a good thing um, and increasingly scarce down here. Um, so, uh, as Don mentioned, I'm going to roll through um, a little talk about um, managing fire escapes. What's a fire escape? It's a landscape that's on fire, that's evolved to fire, that's not supposed to be on fire, but now is um, in some instances. Um, and my particular focus areas are um, soils and hydrology for the Forest Service. Um, and I'm also a formally trained geographer, and so I have a really strong interest in trying to piece together differences in a spatial context. So I'll walk through how we got here, Californians, talk about SoCal story a bit, um, dive a little bit into the, the geekiness of some stuff that I do and some tools that the Forest Service uses um, when it uh, does its job, and then kind of, you know, hand wave a little bit about, um, I think, what the future holds for us. So... One of the more surreal pictures that I remember um, coming across, um, this is Highway 101. In the background, we have hills that are on fire. The hills have been on fire in the West for a long time. We've had freeways for a long time. We haven't usually had them together all that often. Um, so it's pretty freaky. Um, something's going on here. We've got the natural ecology of the landscape. Um, you know, the the birds and the flowers and the hill slopes and the soils and the water and the human ecology that we built up around it and taken advantage of because California is so blessed with its uh, climate and its um, natural beauty and we've got fire and we're kind of stumbling now about what's going on with this um, this uh, kind of these three uh, three circles how they link together so I'll give you a little bit of background um, uh, the Western forest um, acreage has held pretty constant over the past 150 years. So you've got in the bottom is time from 1760 to 2000, um, and then you've got a million acres of forest in the interior west, this red line, pretty constant. From 1926 onward, the acres that have burned have actually seen their spike in the 30s and then gone dramatically down. Pretty much held at a very low level by us starting in the 50s and moving forward. And there was this thing in the, because the Forest Service, uh, this federal government um, uh, agency that manages a lot of these natural landscapes, instituted this thing they like to call a 10 a.m. rule, where if a Forest Service ranger had spotted a fire and it wasn't out by 10 a.m., they'd better find another job. And so that began a culture of keeping fires out of forested landscapes. And there's a problem with that, which is that wildfire is a keystone eco ecological process in most of California. Now, I don't want you to get too lost in this uh, colorful Rorschach test here, but um, what you've really got here is color-coded fire regimes. So the green, which would be a lot of tree forest acreages in California, is adapted, evolved to burn anywhere between um, once every zero to 35 years. Um, so that's frequent at a very low severity, meaning not everything's killed. Um, SoCal is this purple, also evolved um, for fire less frequent, 35 to 100 years, and then when it burns, it burns completely. Well, regardless of how frequently it's supposed to be burning, we've excluded it for about 150 years, for the most part. In forests, that's a problem, because when you start excluding trees, and trees still sprout underneath, or excuse me, excluding fire, trees will sprout underneath, and when fire is introduced into this landscape, after trees have grown up into this understory, they'll catch fire, and that fire will serve as a ladder to bump up to the next tier of vegetation, which will serve as a further ladder. And eventually you have what's called a running fire, where fire will torch across the landscape in the crowns of these trees. So a low severity fire that these forests are adapted to moves through here before this grows up and keeps fire at a low intensity and doesn't kill everything and doesn't lead to large wildfires. So that's the ecology. What else is going on? Climate-driven aridification, um, climate change, the 2012 to 2016 drought 
um, in California was particularly severe on California's forests and fairly unprecedented um, and led to massive tree mortality. This is the western slope of the uh, Sierra Nevada, which um, is actually really near where I um, live and work now. Um, and so you can see all of these orange pine trees are all dead from the drought from 2012 to 2016. Now, some ecosystems are evolved to thin themselves in response to drought. Some ecosystems are, are evolved to be completely taken out by wildfire whenever fire sweeps through it. This is neither of those. This is incredibly unnatural, um, at least in the sense of um, what we understand with the natural history. So there's something else going on in this picture. So all these people hanging out with their barbecues and their you know, RVs that they come up and enjoy the beautiful shores of Bass Lake on the weekend. So how do we get here? You start off with an ecology that's adapted to fire. You exclude fire through land use policies. You stop managing the forest for a variety of reasons, either because you want to harvest timber off the landscape as if you're farming trees, or you then flip to the other side of the spectrum and don't want to harvest anything because we're trying to protect all the ecology out there, which is what started in the 1970s. So those competing forces, you impose climate change on top of it, extreme droughts, and then you start growing yourselves in the environment um, as far as our human development, and it's the recipe of burning palm trees. So now I'm going to bounce a bit to SoCal because I realize there aren't a lot of trees down here, but you still got a lot of vegetation. How many of you ever heard the term chaparral? Awesome. So chaparral doesn't have an understory and an overstory. It's just a carpet of shrubs, dense. So when fire gets in here, it burns completely. This is the Whittier fire just outside Santa Barbara um, that ironically I had the opportunity to work on um, about uh, two years after I finished my master's work at UC Santa Barbara and the fire was threatening campus and it was pretty freaky and then so I was able to come back here and kind of pay back to that community a bit. But you can see here what you're essentially looking at is like, you know, a nuked landscape. And this is actually typical for Chaparral. Um, this is not snow, obviously, it's a lot of ash. And then you only get some pockets of vegetation that are still alive. So this is a burned chaparral hill slope from the uh, Sierra, um, western slope of Sierra. And obviously when you get that type of veg community and then you get rain on top, after it burns, you get rain on top of it, you start to get a lot of erosion, right? So this was pretty cool. These are beautiful curvilinear features. These are rills and this is all divergent because the water as it came down just kind of followed the contours of the landscape. So this is hill slope erosion, soil loss. Where you get convergent areas up in these areas, then you get mud flows and those mud flows converge together, find their way into a channel, pick up speed. Eventually, if you can imagine, you know, some sort of low-lying area where it may be like, you know, there's a dam that, you know, well, at some point served a purpose of impounding water, now impounds sediment. This is the Matahila Dam, um, which is just outside um, Ventura. And uh, this is what it looked like after the Thomas Fire um, was rained on about four days after it got put out on January 9th. Um, this is obviously not the way dams are supposed to function. Pretty crazy picture. So here's an aerial uh, shot of Montecito. Um, mountains, coastal plain. This is an uplifted marine terrace that's been dissected. It's low lying. And the biggest indicator that something really went haywire here, I know this, this is kind of a grainy picture, hard to see, is that if you squint a little bit, you can see these plumes of brown at the very bottom. And that's all mud and, I mean, it's soil that has come off the hill slopes and ash found its way across Montecito, um, caused a lot of, you know, problems and destruction. Um, so landscape evolution is what I call it in some ways. You've got tectonic uplift, you've got natural fires, you've got rainfall, sediment is moving off the up, uh, the higher areas um, across into the sea, but when you've got 
a lot of people who have settled this landscape in between those two process domains, then it becomes problematic. So this is where I kind of, you know, hang my hat every day at my, at my work, um, at least when it comes to fire season. And obviously a lot of this comes to post fire erosion. So um, what are some of the drivers? So I'm just going to walk through some of the physical processes and then, like I said, some of the tools that I use and uh, my colleagues used um, when we work with this stuff. Come in, join us. So the post-fire erosion drivers, residual soil cover, soil burn severity, topography, and rainfall intensity. Cover means physical cover um, from of the soil by vegetation. So here is a burned environment and it gets very patchy. So here, I love this picture because actually you can see the ash here. This is all a burned area that's burned fairly hot. And so all of the needles have been singed off the trees. A lot of the downed wood has burned in place and that's what the white is. There's very little soil cover left here. You've got complete consumption more or less on the forest floor, but you still have burned needles that actually intercept rainfall as it comes down and serve as a little bit of an energy absorber before it hits the soil. And then here you have obviously an unburned patch. So there's a spatial mosaic that creates or that uh, comes about when you actually burn a landscape. It doesn't necessarily all look like a nuked environment like chaparral. And that spatial pattern is important. Um, in the desert, you get obviously a different mosaic because the plant tends to clump and cluster and so there's not a lot of dead vegetation in between the plants. Um, and then in the grassland, they tend to also burn completely like chaparral, however they also leave a residual mat of dry matter. So vegetation matters, it helps determine your residual soil cover. From there, you look at soil burn severity. And this is where I think things really get interesting. So when you bake soil, different things happen. You kill a lot of bugs and microbes when it's not so hot. Physical and chemical impacts, which is what really start to cause problems, are more in the moderate intensity. And then once you get above 500 degrees C, you essentially start melting soil back into a rock, like the kind of stuff where, you know, like it's molten in the mantle and um, uh, you pretty much, you know, completely destroy it. We rarely see temperatures this high. Usually we're worried about the physical and chemical impacts in that mid-range. In a nutshell, heat, extreme heat destroys the soil structure and it consumes uh, the fine roots and creates essentially a dust. So if you would have gone to this soil prior to the fire and tried to scoop some up, you would have seen some what we call aggregation, you know, so there's some cohesion to the soil. It's like if you've gardened before, there's some clods, there's some, you know, some uh, roots holding it together, all that's gone and it's pretty much just moon dust. Another thing that happens, the plants obviously burn completely, that's the above ground change. Below ground, there's a water repellent layer and this is a natural property um, that exists in most western soils. That water repellent layer actually gets vaporized because of the heat and driven downward along the thermal gradient until it cools lower in the soil, recondenses and creates an impermeable layer down there. So you've lost your aggregation, which means you can't really infiltrate that well. You've created this impermeable layer of water repellency, and then you've got some ash that sits right on top of it. So when it rains, you pick up that ash and it just squeezes water like, you know, more than a sponge. It feels really surreal. You dig no more than two to five centimeters down below that water repellent boundary layer and the soil's bone dry. So, this is stuff that we tend to want to focus on when we go out there in a post-fire environment. We're trying to figure out, hey, you know, this is all cool science and all, but what does it matter, right? You know, we know burned soils soak up water and ash and repel water beneath, but who cares? Well, take a burned hill slope, which I'm glad we're not sitting at the foot of right now, <laughs> and put a bunch of water energy on it and you start to erode it like crazy because there's no cover and because there's no infiltration and because this is water repellent boundary layer that kind of dilates the surface and just causes it to run off. 
So this is a, how many of you have heard of LIDAR before? Just a couple of you, okay. High resolution topographic map. They're becoming a bit more common. This one was at a scale of five centimeters. It gives you this really enormous, um, you know, high level of detail. And if you get it before the rainfall event, and then you take another um, LIDAR scan, as they're called, and you get it after the rainfall event, then using a simple differencing, a subtraction of the elevation models that you get from the before and after, you can get a measure of topographic change. And from that, you can get a total understanding of how much mass you've lost off your hill slope, how much soil erosion has been. In a nutshell, though, what you need to just keep in mind is common sense that convergent areas tend to focus kinetic energy and really scour out and drive soil and initiate those debris flows much more than your hill slope areas. In this case, these channels here got eroded upwards of a meter or got eroded downwards of a meter, excuse me, and then you can see a lot of deposition down, um, in the post rainfall event that increased the height of that particular toe slope area by about two meters. So it's just a close up of that. Here's like a, kind of an incipient channel and here's some of those lin curvilinear rills that we saw earlier. So we can quantify that, which is pretty cool um, and increasingly easy um, with things like LIDAR and digital elevation models that you can now get from drones. You no longer need a $70,000 uh, 70, LIDAR scanner or a satellite. I guess you can just buy yourself a drone and do it in other means. Um, in this particular study, they lost 465 cubic meters from the hill slopes, and they deposited 236 cubic meters at the toe slope. So there's a difference there that hasn't been accounted for. It's about 200 cubic meters. So where did that go? It went and looked something like this. In a nutshell, as this thing picks up speed and energy, it goes from move, looking like muddy water to a, to a much more slow-moving, viscous, thick liquid. And then you start seeing very large boulders bobbling on top of that viscous liquid. Because water itself has a density of one, um, uh, or a mass of one gram per cubic centimeter. You increase that density by adding all this sediment and you can actually levitate boulders. So how does, this is where the final ingredient comes in with the rainfall and there's a threshold that we've observed. A threshold intensity which I'm sure we saw in the past 90 minutes right around San Diego by the way. Um, it got pretty intense there uh, for a second. Um, Complicated graph, but it doesn't need to be. So let me just kind of, you know, simplify it. In the bottom, you have increasing rainfall intensity, logarithmic. So that means, you know, you've got 10 times greater, 100 times greater, etc. And then this is your discharge of water. And what, and these, all these individual plots are actual data that were collected on the ground. And someone threw up, tried to do a model fit, and they found that. There's a linear relationship between your increasing rainfall intensity and your increasing discharge up to a point. And at that point, things go crazy. And that point, if you drop down onto the x-axis, comes to a rainfall of intensity of about an inch per hour for 30 minutes. I know that sounds really weird, but just imagine you can drive your car at 70 miles per hour for a minute, or you can drive your car at 70 miles per hour for an hour, right? So it's the same idea. So one inch per hour for 30 minutes, and then your discharge increases massively. And so this threshold amount is what National Weather Service is keying into when they're trying to figure out whether post-fire environments are really about to go sideways. So with that threshold amount in mind, one inch per hour for 30 minutes, which is roughly equal to a half inch, right, oh, um, in 30 minutes, these were the rainfall intensities that were seen outside Montecito. Um, when things really got uh, really bad. So this is actual weather station data, um, a half an inch in five minutes in Montecito, um, an inch, um, over an inch in 30 minutes in Carpinteria. Um, so pretty crazy, right? Now, we have to keep some perspective here though because it was winter and even though it was a 100 year return interval storm 
storm or a 200 year return in overall storm or whatever they want to kind of say like how rare it is and they you know categorize it out in terms of our historical records it happened in winter you'd expect that to happen in winter what you don't expect is a massive wildfire in December that lasts for four weeks and ends on January 5th. And so this is where the climate you know, um, equation starts to really factor in and um, we have to kind of understand that there's, a, there's something different happening than we've seen in the past. Oh, so I mentioned levitating rocks. Yeah, that's, you know, these things weren't just carried down by gravity, they were floated along the debris flow. It's hard to believe, but it, it truly does happen. Um, and that's someone's roof in the background. Okay, so landscapes burned. So, okay, I'm getting paid. Now what? Um, what's my role here? <laughs> what do they pay me to do? Pay me to talk to you guys? No? It's all right. I like doing it. Um, there's a lot of federally owned land in California. Um, I w it doesn't matter what agency it is. The point is that it's public land when I say federally owned. So people recreate on it, we, we mine it, we, we um, log it for timber, we collect water, and we create hydropower on it. It's, it's ours, um, collectively. And Forest Service in particular is really good at fighting fire because we've been doing that for over 100 years, suppressing it. And um, in this case, it's kind of a little bit like a war on fire. Um, now, you know, these people, not these people individually, but in general, these people are my colleagues and they do their jobs for the most part really well. Um, the problem, if there is a problem, it's that it's kind of a huge focus area and we're not quite um, completely in balance with all of our priorities. In any event, um, me and some of my colleagues, hydrology, soils, geology, um, recreation, engineers who manage the roads, we come in afterwards as the burned, emerg burned area emergency response team, bear teams. And this is something that, if you haven't heard of bear teams yet, if you keep doing natural resource stuff or keep going out into the woods and, and you'll start here, this, this term will come up. A post-fire environment, the bear team's been called in. Like, oh yeah, we got capes. Like, no, not really. Um, so we assess burn impacts across the landscape. We try to estimate the erosion and flood potential of low-lying areas that are, um, are below those landscapes and then prescribe some stabilization measures. Our priorities by law and by policy, first, we are trying to protect people's lives. Property is second. Soils and water, yeah, if we can get to them, cool. You know, but it's just, you know, this is how the reality of doing natural resource science um, sorts out, and, and, you know, as it should. First thing we probably do is uh, look at what's the spatial pattern of water repellency. And so this is when I'm going to geek out just a little bit for you. Um, how many of you guys have heard of remote sensing? of which LiDAR is, no? Okay, that's cool. Uh, how about GIS? A few of you too, okay. Um, how about satellite imagery? <laughs> right on. So, um, uh, satellite imagery is just remote sensing within the visible spectrum. It's pictures collected from afar using um, sensors that can detect um, the reflectance of radiant energy. And it turns out that every object on the Earth's surface has a different signature of its reflectance across the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, the way we perceive all this stuff is just for the visible spectrum, but the EM spectrum is actually quite large, and so there's a lot of EM radiant energy out there that's being reflected all the time that we can't see, but sensors can. Just keeping in terms of the visible spectrum, though, conifer, that's just a fancy word for a tree if you haven't heard of it, you can see that it's a it reflects more green than anything else. That's what that arc is. It's like a reflectance arc. It doesn't reflect much blue, it doesn't reflect much red. It's vegetation, it reflects green. Asphalt, black, doesn't reflect anything. Water reflects a lot of blue, not much else. Really basic principles. But now we have the sensors that can detect this stuff at a um, regular occurrence where and when we want to within the EM spectrum wavelengths that we want. So, just to kind of expand on that a bit, 
This is um, the y-axis is a reflectance intensity, just an amount of reflectance, and then here's the full EM spectrum. Healthy vegetation, again, reflects a lot in the green spectrum. Goes back down, and red reflects basically all infrared. Blah blah blah. You get the picture. It's it's a signature. Imagine like you know this is this is a this is vegetation's John Hancock. You know, dry bare soil has a different signature. Clear water. You can apply this really easy to burned areas. Obviously, burned areas don't have a lot of vegetation. And so in general, this is what the signature looks like. And you can literally do a differencing at each position, at each wavelength across here. And you can come up with what ultimately is this map right here. It's called the normalized burn ratio. But here's your pre-fire condition, and this is a Landsat picture. By the way, Landsat air, uh, satellite imagery has been with us since 1972. So that was the first remote sensing platform. It's now what is that, like 45 years old? So um, we've got long records of, um, from Landsat, and it's all publicly available. Um, Pre-fire condition, post-fire, yeah, you can see the burn scar, kind of, sort of. But with this NBR, as it's called, it really pops out. And if you take that image that I was just pointing at, that black one, and you um, subdivide into different categories of low to high severity, then you can come up with what's called a burned area reflectance classification map. These things are produced on any fire greater than 500 acres on Forest Service land. Um, they are automatically ordered up um, whenever a wildfire is a reaching containment and a, burn, and a bear team is going to be coming in and trying to do some post-fire assessment. So um, that's really awesome because this used to be kind of the domain of like researchers and now it's just what we do. Um, and that wasn't that long ago. It's, um, the Cedar Fire in 2003. How many of y'all remember that? Yeah. yeah, so that was the first attempt, a white paper came out of that and that was the first attempt um, to try to think about how we can use satellite imagery in order to identify areas of the landscape that have burned hotter or cooler. Um, for what it's worth. So, small comfort for those of you who had to deal with that, but definitely helped move things forward. Um, all right, so we've got these bark maps, burned area reflectance classification maps. Ultimately, it's just a change of vegetation. And because of those things that I mentioned, the loss of surface or soil structure, the enhanced water repellency, the loss of cover, we really want to know what the conditions of the soil are because they don't necessarily match up. So this can all be consumed and you can have very little disruption of the soil. Or it can be consumed and you can have massive disruption of the soil. So we needed some way to translate the bark maps to a soil burn severity map. And that's where geeks like me come into the picture. Forest Service loves protocols. So there's a protocol for going out and measuring post-fire soil burn severity. Um, here's me testing for that water repellent hydrophobic layer with a you know highly sophisticated hydrology device, um, and uh, so this right here is a bark map, and we go out in the field and we're like, hey, the bark map shows this area burned at high intensity. Are we where we're supposed to be? What's our GPS say? And then once we once we're in that patch, that spatial patch, we go onto the landscape and then see what the soil condition is. And now, <laughs> this is a picture of us doing that sort of thing collectively and discussing the results, but I also just threw it in here because I just think it's really hilarious. I'm still trying to decide like how I would caption each one of us clowns as we're kind of like, you know, like, well, you know, this guy's like kind of looking off into the woods and this guy's trying to fiddle with his device and he's talking to the photographer and I guess Kellen and I are just trying to look very official um, what ultimately this amounts to is that um, we were doing some interagency training because um, myself and my colleague were called to help the National Park Service with the um, fire that happened in Yosemite. And uh, we're like, yeah, okay, we can do that. And they're like, oh, by the way, we're going to send um, a Forest Service PR person with you to like take pictures and interview you guys. And that, of course, put all of us like, yeah, we don't really do that. <laughs> like, you know, we're introverted scientists. Like, so this is us trying to awkwardly act not introverted. 
Anyways, um, so bark map, again, the change in vegetation uh, from a fire. Red being very severe um, and green being not so severe. Red being it burned very hot, major change in vegetation. And then yellow being moderate. When you translate that into a soil burn severity map, looks like that. So very different between those two. And that's important because really the watershed response that generates all these problems and concerns down slope is really a response to the soil conditions. So that's what we do. Here's an example of the soil burn severity map from the Thomas fire. And here is the debris flow probability map from the Thomas fire. Obviously lots of red, steep hill slopes burned completely with chaparral, very hot. Um, and yeah, so this was, this was not awesome to see as a product, but as a scientist, interesting. Bottom line, burned steep hill slopes are a natural erosion hazard. Well, yeah, okay, no, yeah, you needed to go through all that, you know, just to figure that out, come on. I mean, wh what are we doing with this? Are we, wh where's the usefulness to this? So now I like to imagine, okay, now I'm not looking at the hill slope, but I'm looking at my campus and being like, okay, now what am I gonna tell all these people who live down there, who are potentially in harm's way? Another protocol, the second step, now that we've assessed the natural hazard, we look at what's called the values at risk. And so in this case, you have burned hill slopes and the target, so to speak, the concern is in this case, Lake Kachuma, which is a lake that is prone to sedimentation, which reduces your overall water holding capacity of the lake. Lake Kachuma is an important water source for Santa Barbara and the communities on the front. So if you get a lot of erosion, it ends up at Lake Kachuma, that's a problem. Roads, perpetual problem. Roads crisscross national forest land everywhere. People like us <coughs> want to use roads to get into places. Um, most of the paved roads that take us into the Cleveland or the places in the Sierra were old forest or mining roads. Now, here's an example of a concern about life. So this was on the Ferguson fire, which was this summer. It was in Yosemite, and if you take if you go into Yosemite from Merced, which I'm, I don't think many of you have done, but just to bear with me, it's a steep canyon. There's no roads except this one narrow corridor. There's a huge rock slide there in about a decade ago. They still haven't figured it out, so they shut down a section of that road to one lane. And it remains to this day just one lane, which means that there's a stoplight on either side of this shutdown. And so you pull up on Highway 140 to go into Yosemite, and a lot of people do this because it's Yosemite and it's tourists, and they line up like cattle, and they wait for traffic to pass them, and then they go the other way. All right, so here was the burned area, and up there is that section where that one-way road passage exists. So one of the huge concerns we had from a, uh, a life hazard point of view is if people are sitting at this road and a huge frontal system comes in and drops a lot of rain, initiates a debris flow, they're literally sitting ducks and they've got nowhere to go. So these are, you know, these, these concerns can become very real and, you know, have a lot of traction um, uh, very quickly. And so we have to identify where these values at risk are. And so here's that old cedar fire boundary again, and they identify where all the values risk are and, GI and label them in GIS. And everything that I've said in the last 20 minutes and most of what I do in service of my role with the agency comes down to this risk matrix. Um, we take the probability of the damage or the, or the loss, the probability of the natural hazard initiating and causing a problem and then we take that against the magnitude of the consequences of that loss. So for example, if we know that there is a road bridge that's going to blow out um, because it's in a high risk area, we'd say that is very likely. But say that road is way the heck back in the forest and no one ever uses it anyway. And hey, if the culvert's undersized and then the bridge blows out, well, maybe we're actually doing some sort of restoration anyway, and ultimately. So we just classify that as a low risk. If on the other hand, 
that bridge lies right at the point where, you know, I saw, I showed you guys that highway. It's a really high risk. And so this is, it's, it's an interesting um, intersection for me as a scientist because when you ultimately, at the end of the day, you take all the scientific information, you come up with some sort of probability, and you know it's grounded in the physical processes that occur, but you have to actually link it back to societal vulnerability somehow. And this is how we do it. Um, and we go one through one, and we look at each one of those values, and we rank them. And if they rank very high, then we think, well, what can we do to try to mitigate? Um, unfortunately, they're not a hell of a lot because the only things we can really do is cover the soil ultimately and hope that that keeps it in place until vegetation regrows and starts to restabilize the soil. So we broadcast a lot of, a lot of agricultural straw. Um, we spray a lot of hydro mulch, which is just like kind of this sticky stuff that like holds the soil together. And then we do a lot of this. This is a bunch of um, it's a combination of scientists like from Forest Service and CAL FIRE with first responders, Caltrans, municipal water suppliers, basically everyone who kind of has a vested interest in trying to make sure that the infrastructure and the public are safe and we have these collective meetings and we discuss our results and then figure out how to actually communicate them to you all. Uh, National Weather Service, they're at the table now. This sort of collaboration, this interagency process where we operationalize the science into the sphere of the societal reality that you all live in, this has seen like enormous um, increases in collaborability in the past four years. I mean, it's just been really phenomenal in California to watch that transform. Nonetheless, there's no real standing army of unicorns to save any of us if fire weather is severe, um, which is why things up in paradise, you know, like went as badly as they did. Um, and if you go on Twitter, you're always going to find someone saying, well, where the hell was my announcement and my warning? And why wasn't I warned in time? And, and you know, like, oh, I didn't, uh, you know, why didn't we do this and that? And it's like, we know what we're doing, but there's still... At the end of the day, we just have to kind of, you know, watch out for ourselves um, and try to stay in touch with um, the information flow. All right, so getting back to what we can do. Um, the total burned area in, for five years, 2009-2014, was 5.4 million acres. Well, the Forest Service only occupied 1.4 million. The high erosion hazard was only 400,000 acres of that. And once you actually get to the point where those high erosion hazard falls within slopes of 30 to 65 percent, which is the slope ranges of effectiveness of those treatments that I showed you, you're down to 86,000 acres to treat out of 5.4 million burned. So um, there's a lot of constraints, and there's not much we can do about that. Technology is not going to help us. Um, you know, we're not going to innovate our way into figuring out how to take 5.4 million acres at 85% hill slopes and manage to stop erosion from happening. It's, a, it's an earth system process. Um, weeds and straw are also, um, weed seeds that get in straw are also a huge problem because we don't want invasives to take root. So there's some limitations there. So I'm going to shift this back to SoCal and the reality we have now. Another uh, term, anyone heard of the uh, wildland urban interface or the WUI? No? A couple people, maybe. Um, it's where you all live <laughs> for the most part. Um, it's this transitional zone between um, development and non-developed and non-built hill slopes and areas. Um, this map was generated in 1985. Um, so the WUI is where a lot of the devastation happens because this is where fire is moving through in its natural process state and then runs up against the city of Sonoma, for example. Um, so, or Santa Rosa, that was. Um, so the WUI has expanded dramatically because we've continued to develop and we've continued to grow and we've continued to do California stuff. As a result, human started wildfires represent about 
95% of all California wildfire ignitions. I mean, that's, you know, catalytic converters, um, utilities, you know, their power lines getting down in high wind events, um, barbecues, you name it. So this isn't true when you get up into the northern states. They're still mainly lightning caused. Here's an interesting histogram. This is the frequency of, this is the number of wildfire starts, and this is the days of the year from January to December 31st. The uh, um, blue represents lightning caused starts. You can see they peak here in let's say about September, August. And then here's the, the red represents human caused starts the number of starts, and when they occur in the year. What do you think that spike is right there? Fourth of July. Fourth of July. So we're out there, we're out there doing stuff. We've ex one way um, in an ecological sense people think about this is that we've expanded the human fire niche. And um, so that's where we're at. Um, so what are we doing about fire? Well. Stephen Pine, um, one of the primary um, fire ecologists, he pretty much said it the best, if we keep fighting a war with fire, three things are going to happen. We're going to spend a lot of money, we're going to take a lot of casualties, and we're going to lose. Um, it's not trying to be, he's not trying to be dramatic, he's just trying to point out that if it's a natural process that we've set ourselves up for because of excluded fire and the ecological issues and climate change, the proportion of the total uh, budget that's going to um, Forest Service um, just for fighting wildfires is well over 50%, um, which makes doing other resource management activities to prevent fire a lot more difficult. But ultimately, what do we want to do? In a forested environment, and I understand that you guys are in chaparral, it doesn't apply, but you know, if you could bear with me for a minute. In terms of forest management, we want to take forests that have become overgrown because we've stopped managing them, um, because we're trying to generally grow bigger trees, or we're fighting against ourselves because we don't want to harvest bigger trees because we want to save spotted owls and marbled murrelets and various wildlife. So that conflict has led to an overgrowth of the vegetative stands and the density of trees. And so the idea is to take a situation like this, where it's a dog hair thicket, and move it into something like this, where you've redistributed a lot of the fuels that move these fires. So when a fire moves through here, it'll move across the forest floor and not ignite all the trees around it. Um, fire regime restoration. Here's an example of what that looks like. You're cutting out a thing of a bunch of trees and stacking them into piles. These piles will sit on the landscape for a year or two while they cure, and then under controlled conditions, then they'll come along and they'll be ignited um, by us um, in a controlled fashion. It's a way of thinning the forest. Um, and then for the wooey, it's all about creating defensible spaces. Um, defensible spaces meaning not that fire is not going to enter your property, but when it does, you have the ground conditions that allow firefighters to actually light a back burn into your property area. So that way it consumes all of these fuels and when the flaming front comes close to your property, it stops because it's run out of fuel. There's an interesting thing about defensible space in the foothills of the, uh, well, this is probably certainly true even around here. People who live in the Wooey in the eastern part of the county. If there's a fire going on, a wildfire, and it's raging, and there's, uh, fire, there's people responding to that, and they're trying to decide what houses to protect and what houses not to protect, they will protect homes with defensible space. They will drive by homes that don't have it because it's, it's like a fire fighter deciding what burning building they would rather enter. They know they have a better likelihood of success um, if the home has defensible space. So this, this sort of information is creeping out. Um, ultimately what we want to create are spatial firescapes because we don't want to manage the ecosystems the same everywhere. We don't want to go into wildernesses and thin them out. That's not the way wildernesses are, were designed to work by our society or ecologically. So here's an example of the western slope of the Sierra National Forest. 
And this blue area is all wilderness. And this is a proposed forest plan. It's a guidance document, really high level, that's going to you know, steer the forest for the next 20 years. In the blue area, is the idea is just to do wildfire maintenance. Lightning strikes, let it burn. It's fine. Monitor it, make sure it doesn't get out of control, but let it burn. Once you move a little bit more towards the front country, it's kind of this intermix area. Not a lot of people go into it, but it's not wilderness. People hunt, people fish, people climb. So kind of a wildfire restoration. Go in there and selectively thin here and there. If a fire starts, yeah, throw some resources at it. But you know, you know you're not trying to aggressively put it out. General wildfire protection in these orange areas, now you're talking about areas that are actually settled. They've got roads, they've got businesses, they've got infrastructure. And then community wildfire protection in red, these zones, because of the density of the structures and the economic um, importance and the threat to um, uh, human life, those red areas, if a fire starts, you put it out. You just go in there, you throw everything you can at it. So it's kind of a thoughtful way to stratify our landscape based on all these different ideas that we have about what we want out of it. Do we want to live in it? Do we want wilderness out of it? So that is all based on doing fuels treatments. Well, here's where we're at in terms of the reality of fuels treatments. The wildfire areas are in beige. These are what burned in each one of these years. And here's the acreages in the black that we've actually treated in terms of fuels treatments. So there's a little bit of a, <laughs> there's some room for improvement, right? Um, we don't currently, f um, we're not very good at funding um, our preventative wildfire practices. We're very good at throwing money at putting fires out. So this was a GIS exercise. So they took a bunch of layers, you know, they would take a resources layer, topography layer, a roads layer, I'm making this up. Um, uh, and I'm going to guess that those, the reds that are deep into the yellow, the wildfire restoration, um, are either um, like rural recreation outposts, like possibly part of the PCT, you know, where some, where some through hikers will come in. Like, I'm not exactly sure that maybe Florence Lake, or that's the tip of the Trans Sierra Highway, I believe. Um, and then around here, this red area is all going to be special use permit residences. These are, this is definitely Huntington Lake and a lot of people who are lucky have houses that are on the shores of the lake even though it's within a wilderness area. The other thing that may be represented in this map is any hydroelectric or utility. It's fuel treatment. So yeah, we want to do more of this, but there is a risk. Um, I was doing some research prior to going from the Cleveland forest up to the Sierra, taking this new position about six months ago. And I was like, yeah, what do they got going on up there? And um, I came across this. Um, they had harvested a bunch of trees. They could not sell the trees, which is a problem. Um, and so the forest is left to dispose of it because, um, rather than have it use some sort of economic purpose. Um, and the main disposal is going to be by setting it on fire. And so everything was going swimmingly until a mono wind event stoked some of these smoldering embers after the con controlled burn had been going on for a week. And this prescribed fire was declared a wildfire. So things happen. They're not, they're not common, but it does happen. This also happened on the Wasatch Front, actually, um, this summer and led to a major fire. And a lot of people took heat for that. So you try to do pre things preventatively. We know it's what we want to do, but you know, um, things can get complicated. So how do we find our way out of this? We wait for economics to catch up. Why can you build homes in the wooey? Cheaply. Why can you live out there like without, you know, essentially paying enormous property taxes um, or very high insurance premiums? I don't have the answer. I'm just saying it's it's it, but it's a legitimate question. Um, and mainly, you know, the insurance companies are taking notice. Um, they're starting to have to pay out a lot of wildfire claims because of people's homes being destroyed. Um, prior to the craziness that happened up in Paradise, where I think 15 to 20,000 homes were destroyed, which is just insanity, um, the largest, uh, the fire that had the single largest number of homes that were destroyed was the Cedar Fire in 2003. I think it was like 4,000 or something like that. Um, so 
presumably utilities are going to start to figure out the ways to hardscape their environment, to underground, underground their cables, to de-energize de their lines before severe fire conditions. Because the insurance companies may say, you know what, I'm not going to insure you anymore for a wildfire if your transmission or if your transformer was the cause of this fire. Um, there's an interesting thing, I, I've been sharing this with a lot of people, but it's, it, it really, I do actually have part of the answer, not the solution, but I, it's, it's like, why do insurance companies still keep insuring people? I don't get it. The Wall Street Journal two months ago had this really interesting article and they nailed it. The insurance companies right now, yeah, they're having to make payouts, but the economy is cranking, right? We're all benefiting from this in our own ways. And the insurance companies are making so much money off of just doing the business that they do in the era of climate change, where everyone's paying them to try to you know, protect themselves, that the financial markets of Wall Street are taking their um, industry and packaging it into, into securities and using them as financial derivatives to make more money and generate more wealth. The insurance companies are making massive amounts of money off of that. And so even though they're having to pay out a lot of money in these, insur these wildfire claims, they're still making so much more money off of the securitization of their sector that the, um, the claims against them from the wildfire losses are not yet impacting their bottom line enough to rewrite policies, which you and I can't afford, which would disincentivize us to building and occupying these landscapes. So it all comes back to economics, ultimately. Um, Cal Fire's caught up. They're trying to, I mean, they're not insuring anyone, but they're at least creating codes that are geographically, spatially based, saying, hey, if you're in a high-risk environment, well, we're just labeling it as a high-risk environment, and, you know, you can sort it out with your local, you know, um, uh, insurer if they won't cover you. So there are some economic signals there. And then, of course, you know, get the awareness out, right? Try to, you know, try to keep your home from, burning the ground by at least making it defensible. We need new markets for forest products. This is also the, the other side of the economic coin. These small diameter trees, as they're called, um, and then of course shrub, chaparral shrub, there's no economic value in harvesting it. And so there's, there's just no money to be made from going out there and cutting it down, um, which means that you have to, it's, it's a dead expense, it's a sunk expense to try to um, make your place defensible. So we started with this, what's the intersection here? Well, ultimately everything is ecology, right? We're just living within these broader systems. Um, and fire has always occupied a big part of the natural ecology and our human ecology has expanded in into, and created that niche. I'll leave it with this. This is a picture from, um, uh, I was, like, hey, I, should, I just spent two and a half months here on a fire and I haven't really done anything <laughs> to enjoy myself in the beautiful western slope outside Yosemite where I live now. Let's go take a hike. There's some sequoia grove that is on a national forest, not in the national park, not too far from where we live. And so we went out there and um, there, a 2017 fire had burned through the sequoia grove and taken out like 12 of them out of like, I think maybe there's 30 out there. And see, these are the old growth sequoia trees. They're the largest organisms on the planet. Um, survived for one to 2,000 years um, until 150 years of us kind of mismanaging our forests as well as you know, the global climate forcing created conditions that took it out. So it's kind of a stark reality of you know, where we're at right now. Um, but you can see here, it's like this is the, the trunk of the tree. It's burned out at the top, these branches are like, you know, as big as any of these small trees on the perimeter. So, um, so that in a nutshell is how we got here. And I think where we're headed a bit. And like I said, some of the science and the tools that um, I use um, in my little sphere um, to try to try to address it. So with that, thanks a lot. <laughs>